you know, plus he will also, God will also speak to your, um, to your cultural, to the cult, things you know in your culture. That's how he talks, communicates with us, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's take another one. Uh, remember how uh, Israel uh, went through and went and killed Og of the king of Bashan before going on to conquer the promised land? Yeah. And you remember how after they did that, everyone in Canaan was, you know, uh, you know, shaking in their boots and terrified of them. Why? Well, because Og was the last of the Rephaim. And right. you have to understand, the Rapum is the way the Canaanites would pronounce it, at least as far as we know, um, were the dead and deified kings of old. And Bashan, they called Bathan, the place of the serpent. And it was literally where they believed Gandalf to be. So why did God take Israel through this land that was, you know, Canaanite hell to kill its king? Well, think about it. God's trying to send a signal out to the Canaanites that he's stronger than all their gods, so he marches his people through Canaanite Hill, kills their king, and then sets up camp across the Yarden and begins the process. God was sending out a signal using their own beliefs about what would dwell there against them. Here's another interesting one. Mount Hermon, wow. above that, is basically Canaanite Mount Olympus. That was one of the two sacred mountains of Baal. Okay. Now, let's fast forward to uh, the New Testament times. Yeshua is in a place called Caesarea Philippi, which is at the foot of Mount Hermon, and right on the borders of ancient Bashan. He had already made a couple of expeditions into what used to be Bashan. It was called the Decapolis in his day, including where he got into that little conflict with the Legion of Demons, as you recall. Right. He begged him not only not to send them out of the abyss, but not to send them out of the country. Why? Because the demons were the Rephaim, they were the Rapum. They had lived there for thousands of years, and now Yeshua comes with the power to drive them out, and they beg him to instead let them go into some pigs. So after all of that, Yeshua is in Caesarea Philippi, right on the borders of ancient Bashan, and when he said, the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, will not stand against my assembly, it will not stand against my church, he's standing on the gates of Canaanite hell. Really? He's standing right there on the border. Six days later, he climbs a mountain and does the transfiguration. Which mountain? Uh, one tradition puts it at Mount Tabor. I don't think so. I think he climbed Mount Hermon, because that was right there. Wow. He climbed Baal Sacred Mountain and met with Moses and Elijah up there. Why? He was calling Baal out. And you notice that's when everyone really started freaking out about him, when everyone started turning on him and everything else. It was because he went up there and did the transfiguration on Baal Sacred Space, deliberately calling the adversary out. Now... Does that mean he was playing that he was, you know, trying to sneak paganism in? No, he was going to defy paganism, and that's why. And Psalm twenty-two, when it talks about the uh, um, uh, crucifixion, it mentions the b bulls of Bashan surround me. Who are the bulls of Bashan? Again, the bull is the sacred animal of Baal. The Rephaim or Rapum of Bashan are the demons. And why were they surrounding him? Because he had deliberately crossed into their territory and defeated them over and over again and was, had deliberately called them out. And that's why they went into overdrive trying to destroy him. Wow. And these are things that you... Now, if the Bible can take that kind of symbolism and turn it on its head to show how great the God of the Bible is, how great the God of Israel, how great the creator of the universe is, and that all these other so-called gods fall before him, and he can take out their sacred spaces and so forth, then why should Christianity be ashamed that it did the exact same thing? Taking well-known symbols from the Roman Empire, from the Greek philosophers, from the uh, you know, Aramaic people, you know, whatever, and then took them and turned them around to say, no, you've worshipped these other gods because you have been seeking the one who rises. You're worshipping these other gods because you're seeking the one who brings the rain. You're worshipping these other gods because you're trying to find the light. We're going to present you the one who is risen, the one who brings the true rain, which is the Holy Spirit, and the one who is the light of the world. And that's why I've got no problem with Christmas, because that's just one step in doing that. Even if it was connected with Saturnalia, even if that was the original thing, it was not to sneak paganism in. It was to take a well-known holiday and use it as an opportunity to say, but on this day, we worship the one who died for us. That is a pretty heavy duty, uh, that is a pretty heavy duty concept. So, not only should we not be offended at God superimposing himself over pagan ideas, but we should expect it, actually. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This is the fun part. It, I mean, and 
again, I'm going to give credit where it's due. Uh, some of this I was aware of, but uh, Dr. Michael Heiser is the one that really got me into it. I'm really looking forward to his book because I've been reading everything I could find on his Divine Council concept that he's already published or spoken about and got me into doing some of my own research on this. Um, and, you know, frankly, I think the guy deserves to have everyone go out and buy a copy of his book in, in March. But this is stuff that um, we can take. Right now, you've got a lot of pagans who will sit there and say, ha, you celebrate Christmas and that's just, you know, you borrowing from the old pagan stuff, okay? We can, if we will educate ourselves a bit about how the Bible overturns paganism, then we can turn that on its head. Because, you know, when, I, when I've had pagan friends come and say, well, yes, the uh, Jews were just borrowing from the Canaanite legends of El and Baal and blah, 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 and I'm like, yes, but, yes, there's some similarities, but now let's look at the differences. And understand that even in the pagan mythology, every pagan mythology understands that there is a high god above the gods. They don't deal with him a whole lot. They'll make a few temples to try to keep him happy, but they always go for the lesser gods. So when you talk about being Wiccan or neo-pagan or whatever, understand, you're making deals with lesser gods when you could be a son or a daughter of the true and living and eternal god who created your gods. You're giving up an eternal relationship but the one who created you and the one who created your so-called gods for the sake of some temporal power. If we educate ourselves and we're willing to take that and understand that and turn it on its head, I think we can really shock some people out of their complacency enough that maybe the spirit can have some room to do some work. Interesting. Wow. That is really a heck of a concept. It would take a, it would take a lot of, um, it would take a lot more, sessions probably to really flesh it out and explain it better but i mean we have to uh kind of just take on faith that um god will um superimpose himself even his own word over pagan concepts mm -hmm. and uh basically because they're they were culturally re cu cu blah, culturally relevant at the time so he's going to sure. communicate that way right from the beginning he's going to do that and partly because a lot of it they had right, even though they were mm -hmm. pagans. I mean, there's a even uh, even way back in ancient antiquity, there was a you know we all came from Adam, so there was a uh, there was a tradition that existed uh, a knowledge of God, right? And mm -hmm. it got muddled Absolutely. and clouded over as as you know. And especially at the Tower of Babel, when you know the division of the language, you know the the truths and the traditions of God got muddled and changed. But you know God knew that it was knowledge about Him that had been corrupted. So exactly right, right. So the, and the, if the adversary can take these things and corrupt them from His purpose, why wouldn't the God of un the universe redeem them for His purposes? I don't think He needs to leave any ground to the adversary at all. I think he means to redeem everything. That's why Paul talks about taking captive every every thought, okay, because everything God can redeem and turn to his service. You have to remove a whole bunch of the gunk that overlays it, but he is going to redeem the whole world, not just a hand remnant of people that go to heaven and sit on clouds. His goal is to re redeem the physical world, to redeem all the glorious wonders that mankind has made. You know what? Mankind has made some incredible wonders because we're made in the image of God. Unfortunately, we tend to use those wonders in the wrong ways. <laughs> right. And in the process, we mar it. But God's going to redeem all that. That's why in, in Revelation 22, it talks about in the New Jerusalem, the kings are going to bring the glory of the nations into it. That all the things that the nations have made for thousands of years that are worth it, that are good, that are wonderful, are going to be brought into God's kingdom. Even technology? Probably. I, that's the thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly how much um, in our resurrected bodies we're going to be dependent on technology. Right. Uh, we don't know. Eye has not seen nor ear heard, you know. But on their hand, what's technology? It's just applied science. It's just taking the physical properties of the universe that God has created, discovering them, and learning how to use them to uh, do what we want to do. And now, it whether is, to I mean, farm it's... land better, to you know, build craft that fly in the sky, we're just learning to take what God has created and use it. Right, and technology, really, it's just another art form. 
Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's exactly. one of the highest art forms, but I mean, as far as creation, you know, the things from the nations, I mean, that would be one of them. It would be our art, our culture, our music, our technology, mm-hmm. our literature, um, all that uh, to, uh, be brought from the nations into the new city. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And I did I'm not know that. Here, but I believe there will be death metal in the kingdom. Nice. <laughs> 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 wow, you know, I had not even, this is a new one on me, this is all new to me. I I'd read that, obviously, several times, but it had just gone right over my head. That is really interesting. So, God is not only going to redeem our souls, but everything, the mm-hmm. uh, material things. He's going to redeem our art, our culture, our technology, our 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 uh, our our buildings, our our um, literature, um, everything, mm-hmm. music, everything. We're probably got to rebuild a lot of things from scratch after Armageddon's over. But yeah, well, yeah. I mean, all, all that tech, all that ingenuity that goes into creating like the Space Needle or you know the uh, World Trade Center or whatever that they're using to replace it, or that one weird building that rotates in a weird way over in Dubai or whatever. All that ingenuity will still be there among the redeemed. So why wouldn't we be using that ingenuity to build things that are praising to God, not just praising the man, but praising to the God who made us in a way, you know, no longer trying to exploit each other, no longer concerned with, you know, petty ego, with uh, fighting over resources, with dominating each other, but taking all that same ingenuity and turning it to the service of God for all eternity. It's going to be really cool. <laughs> wow, that is a whole new concept to me. I'm, that gives me a lot to think about, and the listeners too, probably. Uh, wow, I had never considered that. That is really something. You know, it, you know I think about, you know, uh, mankind and all of our achievements. And, you know, a lot of times it's easy just to place a corrupt label on all of it. And uh, But, you know, a lot of times I've long thought there's some things that are not corrupt about us. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of our music, uh, a yeah. lot of our art, it seems... Um, you know, I mean, sure, it's been corrupted. A lot of it's been corrupted, but the essence of it is not is not a corrupt thing. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, um, you know, walking. Well, sure. I mean, when I was a kid, I, I uh, heard a uh, Christian death metal band called Tourniquet. I mean, I don't have oh, the taste yeah. for that kind of music anymore, just because I'm getting old. But uh, I mean, they were. I they their lyrics, the philosophical. I mean, they had like, for example, a song they called uh, the Odyssey. And the Odyssey is, you know, a technical term for that old question of, okay, if God is all-powerful and God is all-good, why is there evil in the world? They wrote a song around a theological concept, and it was really cool, okay? And so they were taking a kind of music they loved you know, that normally is used to, to, in, you know, rebellion and so forth and saying, you know what, we can redeem this, type, this style of music and turn it towards God's service. I think that's cool. I do too. I don't think there's anything pagan about it. You know, the things that we create aren't inherently evil. Nope. I mean, as far as, uh, the, we, we're inherently fallen. Okay, yeah. but that's not the same as being inherently evil. Um, uh, it, the fact that we are made in God's image means that there's a lot of good in us. There's a lot of potential there. It takes Messiah. It takes being you know completely cleansed. And being born anew and removed out of the old means and habits and everything else of our own life to really dedicate that to God and give him what he deserves, okay? But he made us for that purpose. And therefore, not everything we do is 100% bad all the time. It's just tainted. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example. It's like, you know, imagine you have a really ripe, uh, crispy, del- sweet, delicious apple, mm. but it's been dropped in, it's been dropped in the sewer, Okay, you're gonna have to do a lot of cleaning and maybe remove the skin of that apple before you can get to the good stuff inside. But the good stuff is still there, right? Well, and that, it takes. You know, it's easy to get in that frame of mind where no matter what we do, must be bad. You know, right? Well, that's what the adversary wants us to believe. Okay, yeah. You know, when Paul says there's nothing good in me, he's using a very Hebraic comparative. Okay, he's saying, yes, in comparison to the goodness of God, there's nothing good with me in, in me. Um, but that's not the same as saying I'm 100% evil all the time. He talks about struggling and about how he loves the law of God and his inner man, even if he doesn't always have the power to put it into practice the way he 